What happens when two bass road warriors spend quality time talking music and life with one of their peers? Bassist educator author David C. Gross and bassist and head honcho of KnowYourBassPlayer.com, Tom Semioli, trade eights with the legends of rock, jazz, funk, blues, folk, country, and more. Notes from an artist. Revealing conversations with the legends who've created the soundtrack of our lives. What happens? You're about to find out. It's another episode of Notes from an Artist. Hey, Mitch, how you doing? What's up? I'm What's doing Jason? well. I got a flop album book with Salvatore did quite well, did it? did quite well. Hosak is asking for volume two for next year. Excellent. Excellent. Which That's would, great news. Which, which would be a lot of fun, I think. How are you going to configure volume two? Uh, what I'd like to do is bring it, move it a little bit forward chronologically because okay. there's like a lot of albums from the 80s that I'd like to write about. I think we pretty much covered the 60s so I think maybe if Sal is open to it maybe making it more 70s 80s than 60s 70s. I think that that might be the way to go. It's interesting our first uh, interview we had uh, on the 100 flop albums when we debated the years 1966 versus 1971. Of course it's three against one. I've got three 60s guys and I'm, <laughs> guys. I'm the I was just thinking about that this week, actually, because everyone's talking about the anniversaries of uh, Blonde on Blonde and Pet Sounds. Just in one summer to get Aftermath and Revolver and Pet Sounds of Blonde on Blonde. I mean, you know, I don't know how you top that. You've been listening to Rolling Stone's Aftermath. She said, she said, from the Beatles, Revolver, I wasn't made for these times. Beach Boys, just like a woman. Can you imagine all of these records came out in 1966? Right around the same time, this is Notes from an Artist on CygnusRadio.com. I'm 62. You guys have a few years on me, so 1966 doesn't resonate. But in just talking about the book, and David and I with the radio show, some of the live performances we did, I met two individuals that gave me a very good argument why the 80s were the greatest decade for rock and roll. It all depends on when you are 15 years old. I mean, exactly. And that's, I mean, that's always going to be the music that resonates with you the most when music started making the most profound impact. Impact. And yeah. now I was 15 and 66, and, and it just happened to coincide with a renaissance in rock and, and, and that point in the evolution of the rock album, Revolver, Pet Sounds, Blonde, sure. Blonde, yeah, Aftermath. We're all, you know, sort of like the rock album moving from co- just a collection of track to albums that tied together thematically and musically and, and creatively. So we could argue about this over beers for, <laughs> for many, many hours. But there are very good arguments for the 80s, folks in the 90s I really enjoyed well, I'm just it. feeling like a damn smart ass it's Hannah Montana come on that's when that's how when course. things that's really true. decided yeah. to win better yeah. for a certain generation it's going to be in sync in the Backstreet Boys that's just how it works sure, sure. yeah it is and, and Pearl Jam and Nirvana but uh, anyway let's start David do you realize Mitch is a returning guest and he is in the great company of turning champion Ron Carter Dave Swift and John Altman so look at look at the esteemed company you are in Mitch. but Tom why don't you tell our audience a little about Mitch Mitchell Cohen. Well, believe it or not, David, there's some people that don't know who Mitchell Cohen is. So let's, uh, I, I find that hard to believe. Many, yes. Even in his own house. Even my rabbi knows who even he right, is. Even right here, you know, in the other room, there are people that don't know that much about him. <laughs> All right, let's give, uh, this is your life, uh, Mitch, and if I, Mitchell, and if I make any mistakes, please correct me. So for our purposes, David, Mitchell Cohen is a music writer, among other journalistic endeavors. He's written for Cream, High Fidelity, and Musician Magazine, which was a great magazine, Musician Magazine. Uh, he wrote books on uh, Carol King and Simon and Garfunkel for Sire Chapel Books. Correct, Mitch? Uh, yeah, but yeah, okay. way back, back in the seventies. Yeah. Uh, now, akin to many writers, David, uh, myself included, uh, Mitchell found his way into the world of publicity, public relations. Be careful, David. Don't become a publicist. You'll only bring shame. I, on I, you know, in, in my defense, I wasn't so much a publicist as I was a writer of publicity material. So I didn't have to make the phone calls and get the assignments and wrangle for reviews and coverage. Uh, I was just a functionary in the the PR department. A functionary. See, that's the way I should uh, describe myself. I I do the same disclaimer, but you're absolutely right. You work in the publicity department, the public relations department. You moved to creative services, writing print ads, radio spots, one of which, David, won a Clio Award for Monty Python, who are Arista hmm. recording artists. Um, yes, that's true. I always have to footnote that in that I was in the studio working on the spot with Eric Idle. So Eric Idle, one of the most hilarious people in history. And how could the spot 
not have been great. So I just, I asked them questions and I edited it. So, but yes, yes I want a Clio for it. All right, nice work if you can get. Mitchell work in the Arista a &R. You signed to church, Jeff Healy. You helped Dion yes. make his comeback record. Listening to three tracks. The first, Under the Milky Way by the Church. Then, When the Night Comes Falling from the Sky, Jeff Healy. And finally, Yo Frankie by Dion. This is Notes from an Artist on CygnusRadio.com. You did uh, reissues for Arista with the Monkees, Lee Dorsey, the Kinks, the Everly Brothers. And with Rhino, you did the Shirelles and Gene Pitney. That was a long set. Six tunes. The Monkees doing Last Train to Clark. Lee Dorsey doing Ya Ya, the Kinks doing Life on the Road, the Everly Brothers doing Crying in the Rain. I actually bought the 45 when I was a little kid, and Woolworths, Soldier Boy by the Shirelles, and It Hurts to Be in Love by Gene Pitney. This is Notes from an Artist on CygnusRadio.com. He moved over to Columbia Records in 1993, David, and you became senior VP of A&R, and among your Columbia projects were... Maxwell, Nell Nellie McKay, The Ravenettes, Savage Garden, they were huge. You were nominated for a Grammy Award as one of the producers of the Sony 100 Years multi-CD set. David, also, Mitchell is a voting member of the National Academy of Recording Arts and Sciences and the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. He's able to leave Paul Building to the single back. Yeah, yes, the hanging chair. Be careful, David. Yeah, David. I start, I actually stopped the voting in, the, in those things. I just... I just didn't really feel that I was up to speed enough, you know, yeah. and that, you know, that I could speak confidently about everything that was up for a Grammy award. I'd leave it now to people who are, who are more up on everything that's going on, but I still have my card, a member of the recording Academy, but just don't feel I'm as nice attuned to what was, what's happening contemporary. Okay. That's very admirable, Mitchell, the fact that you abstain from doing something. I mean, how many people in the music industry say they know everything, so they'll continue to vote? Yeah, it, it just it didn't seem authentic for me to like say, oh, this is the best pop album of the year. I'm like, I don't know. I haven't listened to enough pop albums start to finish of new artists to make that kind of determination. So I quietly like sl slipped off that, that particular platform. Okay, but be careful, David. He's a powerful man, this Mitchell Cohen. So. Yeah, sure. Okay. For our purposes, if you listen to notes from an artist, and I'm sure you do, David, uh, we had Mitchell and uh, Sal Meta as a guest. Their book was White Label Promo Preservation Society, 100 Flop Albums You Ought to Know. And that was with Sal and Mitch Cohen, Mitchell Cohen and friends. And some of those friends were Lenny Kay, whom we've had as a guest, Rice Teitelman, Amy Rigby, Dennis Dyken, Jim Farber, Ivor Robbins, Billy Altman, Marshall Crenshaw, Peter Holtzapple, Reckless Eric, yeah. Peter Tipnews, Tom Clark, who we drink heavily with, and uh, Lisa <laughs> Frank, is also uh, Mrs. Sal Maida. So that's a fabulous book on Hozak Book. I love, you? Yeah, I loved working on that with Sal and all my Fun. rock writer and musician friends. It was just a blast to do. That book was essentially instructed during the shutdown, and it was a way to keep in touch with people. It was a, it was a way to keep the music community kind of integrated and out to friends and mail articles back and forth. It was right. it, it was quite fun and distracting, and it, I think it turned out to be a fun book to read. And I think next year we'll do another one. All right, very good. Good. Oddly enough, you know, this radio show really started during COVID also to keep in touch with people and yeah. most importantly to learn. I mean, that was the great thing about the show is how much Tom and I learned from all our guests, you included, of course. You go. Well, yeah, the thing about the White Label book for me was like me and Sal, we just asked people to write about albums that they were passionate about and we invited like 50 of our friends. And out of the 50 submissions that we got, you know, we, it's like maybe 10, 15 of the albums were al albums that I didn't know. Or right. didn't know or didn't know well. And sort of like say in lockdown, it sent me to those records. So I, I, I got an education also. And uh, uh, it was fun. Oh, that's excellent. That's excellent. Now, when you do the next hundred, you have some suggestions. I have some suggestions. We'll dig some up for you. But the new book is called Looking for Magic, New York City in the 70s and the Rise of Arista Records. It's out on Trouser Press. And right. one of the things that really struck me when I read this book is how important a label Arista was. When we discuss, when critic journalists discuss important record labels, you always hear Verve and Blue Note and EMI and Parlophone and Capital and Decca. 
But Arista stands right with those labels. What struck, what strikes me about it is that when you mentioned that you worked at Arista, and yes, as I do when people ask, they're like, oh, you know, they made, oh, Barry Manilow, or Aretha, Aretha Franklin, Kenny G, or, you know, uh, it, it, you know, a, a record label is defined by its hits and as, right. as well, you know, it should be, that's, that's the stuff that's seeps into the public consciousness but what was happening i mean when i started at arista in the summer of 1977 i thought i was going to work at like one of the coolest new record labels you know in the city it, it had only started three years earlier not even three years earlier right they, you know they had put out horses by patty smith they had signed lou reed they had signed the kings whom i love uh martha reeves and general johnson and, and the linda lewis they put out Monty Python albums, as, as we mentioned earlier, and, and sound, soundtrack albums from films that I loved. And it just seemed like the like like a very very um, exciting place to be. I mean, certainly I knew I knew about the hits that the Bay City Rollers and, and Manilow and, and Melissa Manchester were having, but that wasn't what compelled me. I mean, that's certainly well one thing. I was happy to get a job offer anywhere, and <laughs> second of all. It was at a record label where I, I was genuinely a fan of a lot of the artists on, 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 the, on the roster. And I think that the perception is that Clive Davis's hit machine. And the way I've been describing this book is that it's kind of like a remix. It's like an Arista remix. It's sort of like he wrote about his own memoir, like all the successes that we had, all the platinum album. What I was doing is like taking some of the same material from some from the same era and bringing up some artists in the mix and moving down some artists in the mix in, in the mix or sort of like showing like a, a broader picture of, of what was going on because I wasn't necessarily so interested in focusing on what was happening on the charts but what right. was happening what was happening in the building and what was happening in the city it was an exciting time to be in New York it was an exciting you know the mid 70s you know, like new wave and punk in one place and uh, what the Brecker brothers were doing at their club Seventh Avenue South and sure. the cabaret scene at Reno Sweeney you know that sort of launched people that Midler and Barry, and Barry Manilow and Melissa there was a lot going on and Arista was right at the center of it it was at the geographical center Fifth Avenue and 57 Street you don't get more middle of New York than that <laughs> exactly and it's like so in, in any direction from that from that, from our neighborhood we were 15 minutes away from the from the bottom line we were like 20 minutes away from the Apollo we would you know could go up, up, up town to the jazz clubs or downtown to <laughs> CBGB's and and if you were in your 20s and you had your first record industry job and you were going out most nights to see music that was new and exciting. I mean, I, I, I want to try and capture that. Yes. I want to try and capture what it, what it was like at the label inside and what it was like to be a part of the music scene dur during that time period. I have a Clive Davis story, obviously Clive, the founder of Arista. And I, I want to tell it to you and, and see if it, it, it's emblematic of his personality. Now, in 1999, I was working for a magazine, small indie rock magazine called Amplifier. And he had a new artist by the name of Dido and her debut record was No Angel. And I walked into his office and he greeted me personally. Now, this is Clive Davis. I know who Clive Davis is. And he put out all my great, all my favorite records on Columbia. And he shakes my hand. He says, young man, you're going to love this artist, Dido. Uh. A young man of 38, I guess. He took me into his office. He was glowing about Dido and, and how important she was. We went into the Arista boardroom, and this is, like you say, on 57th Street. It was it was right out of, of, of the Hollywood movie, this big boardroom. Yeah. And, sure. and I sat in his chair, right? So I sat in, I yeah. sat in his throne. At, the front, of, at the front of that big uh, table? Yes. In the middle of the right. Room. And, and Dido was there, and I met Dido, and, and we, how you doing, and things. And I can understand Clive wanted to start her off with some indie magazines to get that street cred before he bought her to the bigger outlets, which is how it's done in, the, in those days. And he sat down next to her, and I had to ask Clive to leave. I said, okay, Clive, we've got it now. It's okay. Was it that you were doing an interview with her or just a, a listening session? No, it was an interview. I had my oh. tape recorder. You remember those things? And I had my oh, yeah, so, yeah, so very my well. advanced copy, and it was a, it was an interview. He he wanted to stand. I said, Clive, maybe it's better if you leave right now. Oh, <laughs> and he God. walked out the yeah. door. Was that the kind of guy Clive was? I mean, he was just he just wanted to be there. He wanted to be 
whether it was an interview or a performance or a session, was that his makeup? His makeup and and, and was it, it was based primarily on enthusiasm. It was just okay. based on you know the 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 excitement he felt and and you know from the time I met him in 1977 up until when I saw him a couple of weeks ago at his 90th birthday party was just that he he never lost that embracing of the excitement of it when he would play a demo or a new track for us in an A&R meeting or in a product presentation he demanded and rightly so just like full participation full attention because like on the outside I don't think you realize just how rare those moments are when you hear something in a meeting or you hear someone sing at a showcase and you just know that within weeks or months everyone is going to know this mm. and you're one of the first people to be in the room and you know it, it was like that so many times when he would play a record by Aretha or Lisa Stansfield or Patti Smith or, or the Kinks or he said I just just got they just overnighted this to me this is like the new you know this is probably going to be the first single from from the next Kinks album or I found a great song for Whitney or and his excitement he want he wanted that matched by by ours. I mean, he if he didn't think you were getting it, he'd play it again and again to make sure that you did. Because he knew that there's so much at stake. Uh, which with each artist you sign, and I certainly learned that when I started doing A and R, that every signing is 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 a huge investment in time and energy and resources and passion. And even if it ends up not connecting. Which, I mean, that's just the nature of the business. Most things don't. But you go into it with the sense of like, we're going to pour everything we have into, into this. And the only promise I could ever make an artist when I was trying to sign them was a competitive situation and other artists and other labels were saying, I can guarantee you that this record's going to go platinum or this is, you know, a thing, or you're going to get this. I'd be like, look, I can promise you only two things. I can promise you that I will help you make a record that you're proud to have your name on that you know, I would try and help you fulfill your vision and that we will know, we will let people know that this record exists. We will make sure that they know about it. They can make up their own minds whether to spend their money on it. They can right. spend, make up their own minds whether to go pay money to see you live. I mean, that's all out of our hands. All, right. we, can, all we can do as, as your record label, as your advocate, is be the caretakers of your music and be uh, the megaphone that we that we shout into and saying, pay attention. That's the mandate. That was Lisa Stansfield doing All Around the World. That was from her first album, Affection, released 1989 on Arista. This is Notes from an Artist, CygnusRadio.com. And it's what you learn when you do A&R for Clive. People go like, how can you spend that many hours in somebody's office day after day? And it's like, because if you pay attention when he's on the phone with songwriters or producers or mixers or mastering engineers or art, you learn how to do that job. And that's what I, you know, that's what I learned. As a fan growing up in the 70s, buying Arista Records, I don't know how much fans or record buyers are just cognizant of what the label is. They just see the record cover and they, they see the artist. And reading your book, it was fascinating. Of course, Patty uh, did start on Arista, but how Arista rescued and really reinvigorated some important careers. Lou Reed, the Kinks, you mentioned the Kinks. They had a tremendous commercial resurgence. Talk about Aretha Franklin, same thing. Ian Dury. Who would have thought to sign Ian Dury to Aris? All right. So, you were just listening to four tracks. The first was Lou Reed doing Rock and Roll Heart, The Kinks doing Jukebox Music, Aretha Franklin doing What a Fool Believes, and finishing off with Ian Dury. Hit me with your rhythm stick. This is Notes from an Artist on CygnusRadio.com. In researching the book, what it seems to me that Arista is in a lot of ways a redemption story for Clive Davis, that he had, he had been president of the biggest record company in the world. You know, he lost his job in 1973, took over Bell Records in 1974, re renamed it, reshaped it, just to prove that there was no fluke, that what he did at Columbia was repeatable, even with a brand new label, that was independently distributed, and that's really important. Columbia had its own distribution branch system. Five would snap his fingers, and all branch managers in, in all the territories would do his bidding. When you're distributed by independent 
distributors, you have to go to each one and make sure that they make your music a priority. It's hand-to-hand combat, and for him to not go that route was a chance for him to prove that his instincts, his musical instincts, his business instincts were correct all along. And when it came to Arista and bringing in new artists into the fold, sometimes an artist like the Kings or Dion Warwick or Aretha or, or the Grateful Dead, they came to Arista, certainly not at the height of, of their popularity. No, you know, the, same you know, with Iggy Pop. Was yeah, it, it was like each one was at a point where, I mean, at, at Clive's 90th birthday party, um, Dionne Warwick was there. And Dion got up and said that, you know, she met Clive in, in, in the green room of some of some TV show that they were both on. And, and he asked her what she was up to. And she said, you know, I think I've kind of had it. I think I've kind of had it with the music industry. She had been on Warner Brothers after a hugely successful run at Scepter with, with Backrack and David. And she was feeling like maybe time had passed her by. And what Clive said to her was, well, you may have given up on the industry, but the industry hasn't given up on you. Uh, let's see what we can do. Let's let's create uh, an environment where you know where you where you can be Dionne Warwick, and it worked. And I think a lot of that was like Clive saying, in a way, I I got this second chance. I got the second chance with Aristotle. That was Dionne Warwick. I'll never love this way again. This is notes from an artist on CygnusRadio.com. If somebody has talent, if someone is as good a songwriter as Ray Davies, if someone is as good a singer as Dionne Warwick or Aretha Franklin, two of the singers that ever lived, they shouldn't be washed up in their 30s or 40s. I mean, that's just it's not a thing. Well, that was that was the way things were. But it's, when you say this, it's also interesting when you take artists such as the Grateful Dead on Arista, Iggy Pop on Arista, even the Allman Brothers on Arista. Right. They did not. They not necessarily didn't make their best records on Arista. No, that but it was that, something that's that, true. That, yeah. that kept their career going until they had maybe their commercial resurgence, or the fact that they we in those days there was no such thing as a legacy artist. Iggy Pop was washed up. The Grateful Dead were washed up as recording artists. The Allman Brothers were washed up. There was no legacy artist in the 70s and 1980s. You had to have hit. And even though they didn't make their best records, they made records which kept them going, kept their careers going. You were just listening to The Grateful Dead doing Dancing in the Streets, The Allman Brothers doing Mystery Woman, and we ended up with I'm Bored by Iggy Pop. All three recordings on Arista Records. This is Notes from an Artist on CygnusRadio.com. I mean, I happen to like the albums that Iggy Pop made for Arista. They were, yeah, not his most commercially successful, but he never had that much commercial success right. anyway. I mean, it's not like he was he was a top-year artist, except mm. musically. But, uh, yeah, to a large extent, it's what I was talking about of sort of like that vindication of, of, someone, of someone's talent. Yeah. And I think that that's the key to understanding a lot of a lot of the A and R philosophy of the Heritage Act. Well, I think once you've spent your life at Columbia Records and having signed so many incredible artists in the jazz world and the rock world, his move to Arista was really it was interesting in a number of regards. First one is who in their right mind would have signed Anthony Braxton, yeah. Cecil Taylor, and Henry Threadgill. And what's most important about that to me, and I talked with them, Tom about this earlier, is that they're all fantastic artists, well-recognized at this point in time, which showed a great deal of foresight with Clive Davis. You were just listening to three tunes, Anthony Braxton's Opus 40M, Cecil Taylor's After All, Number 2, and Henry Threadgill from the Open Air Suite, Card 4, Straight White Royal Flush. We are going to stop right here, and what a great way to end the show with three of my favorite jazz composers. By the way, this is just the beginning of our conversation with Mitchell Cohn and his fantastic new book, published by Trouser Press, Looking for the Magic, New York City, the 70s, and the rise of Arista Records. Next week, we'll have part two. So, I want to thank Mitchell Cohn and, of course, my partner in crime, Tom Semioli, for another fantastic interview. Also, if you would like to re-listen to this broadcast or want to revisit other Notes from an Artist broadcasts, you can find every one of them on the Notes from an Artist podcast, available with all of the major podcast sites. We look forward to seeing you next week with part two of Mitchell Cohn. (laughs) 